Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. Whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are answering a question from one of our Patreon supporters. If you want the opportunity to ask a question on the show, become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash multi Amory. We're going to be doing this for the next couple of months, releasing an extra episode each week, answering a listener question, and we're really excited to hear from you all what you think about it. While we have spent a lot of time studying healthy relationship communication, We are not mind readers, and our advice here is based solely on the limited information that we have, so please take it with a grain of salt. Every situation is unique, so we encourage you to use your own judgment and seek professional help if needed. The question has been edited for time and clarity. And this is this week's question. How do I put relationship anarchy principles into practice when most people you interact with don't subscribe to it? I love the principles of relationship anarchy, of customizing relationships, any, not just romantic ones, as long as those in the relationship consent. But how can I put these principles into practice more often when 99% of the people I have relationships with don't subscribe to relationship anarchy or even know what it is? And that is from Puzzled. Can we, can we modify this name to be like Puzzled in Peoria or something to add Ooh, a little alliteration Peoria, to it? I love that. We're going to force someone to live in Peoria? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's to further help to help anonymize them further. You know, I think uh-huh. I think that's all right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- this. I really this boils down to I think the the thing that so many of us struggle against, which is like I'm doing something that is not part of the mainstream. How do I survive and thrive? Or maybe even I'm doing something that not a lot of people understand, or people are confused by. Maybe they've never even heard of. How do I survive and thrive? I know for myself, when I think back on, um, I've never really full-time identified as a relationship anarchist, but I've identified as a non-monogamous person or as a polyamorous person for a very long time. And when I think about it, you know, a decade ago, trying to explain polyamory to people and a lot of people being like, what, what, what is that? What, poly, poly what? Like, what is that? That's less of an issue now which is maybe a bonus that at least people have heard the word, but for sure with the relationship anarchy, that's a little more esoteric, I would say. So should Mm. we give a quick definition of what relationship anarchy even is to all of those out there who may not know? Yeah. So, you know, relationship anarchy was born out of a particular queer community in the early 2000s. I want to say maybe, maybe late nineties, early 2000s. Um, Sort of, I guess, the foundational document, you might say, was this uh, short instructional manifesto for relationship anarchy that was written by Andy Nordgren around that time, I think like 2005, 2006 or so. And it spawned this movement that was very much based in this idea that relationships don't need to follow traditional social rules or expectations. You know, people can have any kind of relationship they want with others as long as everyone is on the same page agreeing and consenting. And so... Some people put non-monogamy under the umbrella of relationship anarchy. Some people very vehemently disagree with making that connection. Often the example that I like to use to help people wrap their brain around it is this idea that, you know, maybe you want to have a romantic partner, but you feel more drawn to co-parent with your best friend and roommate. And from a traditional social standpoint, we think, oh, but like you should be having a child and cohabiting with your romantic partner, not with your roommate and best friend. And relationship anarchy principles would posit that, no, like if your romantic partner is okay with that and your best friend is okay with that, everyone should be free to define their own relationship and create their own relationship the way that they want to. I could probably talk a lot more. There's probably going to be a lot of relationship anarchists that are shaking their fists so angry that I've left out certain aspects, but that's maybe the, the rough nutshell definition I would give. And if you want to learn more about it from us, you can go to episode 339, where we talk about the Relationship Anarchy Smorgasbord. That episode is called The Smorgasbord of Relationships. 
And in that, we get a little bit further into the topic. I also want to throw out a amazing episode from the Ezra Klein podcast where he was talking with Raina Cohen, who is the author of The Other Significant Others, Reimagining Life with Friendship at the Center. And it really does get into some of the more nitty gritty aspects of relationship anarchy without necessarily calling it that. But I think that it is a nice kind of introduction to some of those concepts and just the idea that those who are not necessarily our romantic partners can still be extremely important to us and extremely meaningful and beneficial to our lives, even going so far as like making friendships the kind of main focus of life. While you may also have people who you're dating or who you're in romantic relationships with, but you can have friendships be people who are super important and who you maybe raise children with or who you live with or who become co-parents, things like that. She has a lot of different demonstrations of what that looks like in her book. So I hope that we can have her actually on the podcast at some point to check that out and to talk more to us about it. So thank you for writing in this question, Puzzled. I'm excited to get into this a little further. But first, I just want to Shout out to everyone who is a patron right now. Thank you for your support of this show. You are the reason why we've been able to continue doing this for 10 years now, which is wild to think about. But really, it does go a long way to helping us put this information out there to everyone for free. And of course, we also have sponsors of this show, which help us to keep this going as well. So thank you for supporting them. When we think about this question about... You know, I like customizing relationships, they say, and want to know how they can put those principles into practice, even when people don't know about relationship anarchy or don't, or maybe they've heard of it, but aren't interested in it. Um, I guess the, the question that comes up for me is, I guess, like, is it that there's actively a resistance to customizing or is it more like I want a shorthand for how to get the concept across that customizing is even a thing you could do. And I guess when I when I think about that, and I remember this came up a lot even before I knew about relationship anarchy, but just thinking about non-monogamy and trying to explain it and trying to come up with like, what's the shorter way, the kind of the relatable way to explain it to people. And the example that I used to use back then was just when we think about defining a relationship by a label, one of the big ones is labeling it as monogamous. Mm. But I always say if you were to ask a hundred different people, what exactly does monogamy mean? Or maybe more specifically, what counts as not being monogamous? That you'll get a hundred slightly different answers on that. And the reason why I would say that is just not to say monogamy is bad or non-monogamy is better, but just to go, we kind of take for granted that everyone else assumes the same thing we do. So I'm wondering if there might be a similar version of that with relationship anarchy Just something to kind of bring up as a point to show how even if we think that uh, being a boyfriend or girlfriend means this set of things or being platonic means this set of things to kind of bring up some, well, yeah, but do they always that people actually disagree about this? So I just want us to have an open conversation about what this means. I'm trying to think what that might be like starting small somehow. Yeah, like like if it's about physical affection to kind of be like, you know, for for some people, if I have a platonic friend, that means we don't cuddle or hold hands or or anything. And for another person, it's like, oh, I'm super cuddly with my platonic friends. And that just because we use the same label doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. I don't know. Can you think of any other examples that might help as kind of this shorthand to get someone to go, oh, yeah okay, that is a conversation worth having because, yeah, maybe it's not as cut and dry as I think it is. Often when we think about relationships with our friends versus relationships with a romantic partner, we kind of put them on like different pedestals or on different steps of a ladder, like one is higher than the other in essence. But if we were to look at friends and if we were to look at maybe siblings, for instance, or we're to look at just multiple people that kind of operate in a, in a similar sphere. Like a parent probably wouldn't say, okay, that child is more important to me than this child, for instance. 
And I think that that's kind of a an analog for maybe looking at potentially relationship anarchy, that you're not necessarily saying this person is more important to me than this person. It's It's rather, I want to be able to have everyone sort of be meaningful to me in different ways. And I want to discuss what those ways are. And I want us to collaborate on how we can sort of exist in life together, not placing each other on different tiers in in how we have relationships together, maybe. I mean, I love it. As someone who loves relationship anarchy, I love it. I just think that that's like the next level. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like the the idea that oh, well, we just don't want to prioritize romantic relationships over other types of relationships, which is usually what that boils down to is kind of the first challenge to the norm. I I could see that getting a lot more resistance right away from someone who has not already been thinking about this than just the idea of how, how can we determine what, what parts go into this relationship and what parts don't and kind yeah. of like the a la carte menu sort of analogy could be helpful. I like I I want us to all get there. I just as you were saying it, I could just hear all the voices yelling and, and being like, nope, shut you out. You, you I know, think, nope, absolutely not. I think I just want to create a way for people to at least think about it or explore it or try to tell them like this is what I mean when I'm talking about the concept of relationship anarchy. Because people understand, okay, I have multiple siblings or I have multiple kids. And I'm not going to place one above the other in various ways, maybe like deep down, but but not, re- you know, you're not going to say like, I love this kid more than this kid. So I, I don't know. I, I guess in my mind, that's where I go to just try to basically give a person an understanding of what we mean or, you know, what we're starting out at. I just think you got to ease them into it because I just I just <laughs> feel like they, they're going to come back and go like, yeah, sure. But I'm going to prioritize my kids over my mail carrier. So you've sure. just invalidated your whole argument. Of course, like kid, okay, but you I feel, have okay, the label kid, like you get higher priority. Jace is in the Jace is in the ease them in camp. I think Emily, you're a little bit more in the rip the bandaid off camp. Sure, sure, perhaps yeah. maybe you're just. Know. I'm just trying to like have a conversation with people. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's yeah. ripping the bandaid off more. But but it, it, some people have to figure out a way to like talk about this. Yeah, at but all. I, I think both approaches can be valid. Like I think the more deep end, rip the bandaid off approach is for someone that maybe has given you enough signals that like they are curious and open Mm. yeah and someone where you could be like hey google relationship anarchy hey check out the manifesto and then let's talk about it you know like you seem like someone who's who's maybe ready to jump into some weird shit with me (laughs) um you know or jump into some some alternative shit yeah yeah yeah, non-normative philosophical stuff with me or at least have those conversations so i think that's maybe a good way to start with that person and then the ease them into it is is for someone where maybe you haven't gotten those signals yet because to be fair someone who's coming from a more normie or mainstream point of view I, i do think that the pitch for relationship anarchy can suggest a sense of groundlessness that can be very scary to people and sometimes I've I, honestly, I've seen people weaponize the label of relationship anarchy to justify some some very, I guess, groundlessness producing behavior. You know, I have seen some mm-hmm. people who maybe are in a time in their life where they're like, I don't want any commitments. I don't want to be beholden to anybody. I don't want anyone to have any expectations of me. I'm a relationship anarchist. Deal with it, which I, you know, I take some issue with that particular approach. But so in that case, I think then it comes down to you may have to abandon the label in that particular conversation. And it may be more about laying out, these are my values. Things like, I really prioritize time with my friends. Or I really make sure that in every relationship, I'm sitting down to have very specific conversations about what our relationship is going to look like. Or I don't want to put pressure on particular relationships to escalate in a particular direction too quickly. It's like, these are my values and... This is what it looks like to me in real life. This is how I practice it. And of course, you're never going to be able to 100% eliminate somebody's anxieties if this is new to them. But but yeah, I think that in that case, it may be more about really boiling it down to like, what is the value and what is the behavior for you? I really appreciate what you just said, because I do know that 
I've been in a relationship where even just the suggestion of, well, I don't want to label you as the absolute most important person in my life because I have so many amazing, important people in my life and I don't want to put you necessarily above them, that that was a really big problem for that person that I said Mm -hmm. that to them. Even though just I have had, you know, more time with, for instance, the two of you or my mom or my friends from home who I care deeply about, like those types of chosen family people are going to all kind of exist similarly to me in terms of their importance and in terms of like the life that I want to have that they are involved in. And so, yeah, I think that's all really interesting what you said and just making it clear from the beginning, I think, especially in a new relationship to be able to say, hey, these are things that are important to me. And some of those things may feel a little bit different than the types of relationships that you've been in the past, where perhaps everyone is automatically assumed that the the romantic partner is going to be the most important person. And I simply want to challenge that to a degree and talk about the fact that I have other people in my life that are very important too. I really like the idea of focusing on what are the values of relationship anarchy that are most important to you and leading with those rather than feeling like you're presenting this whole new philosophy or new way of doing this, but kind of starting with like, what's really the important part you want to get across? And I think that might vary, you know, as it seems like it varies even for the three of us in terms of where we might start with in it. But it's like, what's the part that is kind of the most important value for you? And just talk about the value without needing to give it this other label, because that might actually make it feel like, oh, cool, this is a good conversation we're having and not, oh, I'm being onboarded into some set of beliefs, which I think can be, could could put some people on their guard. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot that goes into relationship anarchy. I mean, the way this person asked this question was like, how do I put these principles into practice when everyone around me doesn't know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of aspects of RA that don't require somebody else's buy-in, you know? Um, For sure. I'm, you know, looking at the short instructional manifesto for relationship anarchy, I'm looking at things like choosing to trust or of choosing to express love and respect instead of feeling entitlement to somebody's time or somebody's body, for instance. There's a lot of this that that doesn't need someone else to identify as a relationship anarchist for you to put into practice. I will say that sometimes having to have these conversations or explain yourself or find the right words to say, if you're doing that over and over again, that can be exhausting. That does take labor. And so you do need to find ways to re-energize yourself. And if you can get around your people, the people who either also identify this way or at least gel with these same values, if you can connect, even if it's just one person who gets you, that can go a long way to refill that tank because it takes energy to swim against the mainstream. Love that. Well, thank you again, Puzzled, for sending in your question. And I hope this was helpful to you. And I'm glad that it gave us a reason to talk about relationship anarchy in this shorter format for a little bit. Because yeah, coming up with the elevator pitch is difficult. useful, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's difficult, but, but useful and takes a lot of energy. So thank you so much for writing in. If you would like to have a question answered on the show, become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash multiamory. And if you want to discuss our episodes, the best place to do that is with other listeners in the episode discussion channel in our Discord server, or you can post in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our community by going to multiamory.com slash join. In addition, you can share with us publicly on TikTok, X, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you like to be online. Multi-Emory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Emily Matlack, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowork and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 